ரைட்டர் starting with his book called Karnatik Summer Lives of 22 Exponents the second book of his is a very significant one and that is the one that we shall be discussing today this is a book titled the devadasi and the saint life and times of bengaluru nagaratnamma a few more books that uh, he followed it up with they are titled historic residences of chennai four score and more history of the music academy madras and his latest book is chennai a biography welcome sri ramji thank you today i'd like to uh, focus on your second book on uh, bangalore nagaratnamma could you please share how did you come to start writing this book the book happened because uh, in 1983 when Shruti magazine was launched and I was uh, just entering college from school. Uh, I used to live in Calcutta at that time and uh, my cousin who was uh, equally involved in music brought home a copy of the Shruti magazine and in that there was an article on Bangalore Nagaratnamma written by T Shankaran who was one of uh, the best biographers we have had and historians we have had in carnatic music he was dhanamal's grandson veena dhanamal's grandson okay. and uh, he uh, had written this article on bangalore nagaratnam it was one and a half pages <laughs> nothing beyond that but uh, having read that article i found that the uh, lady was a remarkable character and uh, she reminded me in many ways particular her particularly her determination to succeed in whatever she did despite all the obstacles that were placed in her path she reminded me of my father's mother my paternal grandmother who had died just a couple of years earlier to this article being published my grandmother and i we were very close to each other and i must have been around 15 when she passed away and much of my uh, interest in the arts in indian culture uh, came from her and then that's it you know i didn't bother much with that article it somehow remained in my mind that's about it then you know i did engineering i did my mba then i run my oh. family business which is an engineering business which is into hydraulics okay. and uh, so this is in fact you see me wearing the uh, the company uh, yeah that's right right so that is my main activity and uh, so uh, this uh, came about because uh, i know i had written uh, and carnatic summer incidentally was not serialized it was just a book uh, i was contracted to do a book on uh, musicians and i selected the 22 of them and it came out as a book so uh, what happened was that book had been received very well carnatic summer and uh, after that uh, the publisher asked me would you like to write on some something else and then i suddenly this memory of bengaluru nagaratnamma came flooding back and i thought maybe i should uh, write a book on her uh, at this time sometime in uh, you know the in 2002 2003 sanjay subramanyam the singer and i we had started out on a website called sangeetam.com which mm-hmm. was uh, very popular and uh, that had to be updated every week with articles on music and things like that and i was doing a lot of writing for it and i wrote a series on bengaluru nagaratnamma very small maybe okay. uh, three episodes of 600 words each mm-hmm. 1800 words and then i i somehow you know that old memory of shankaran's article came back and then i decided maybe i should uh, write on her life and thereafter i uh, began seriously exploring the possibility and uh, i some strange things happened uh, i sometimes think that you know uh, biographies uh, are are sometimes ordained by the subject themselves and you are ultimately just an instrument who gets to write the book uh, 
uh, what happened was out of the blue, uh, a, a very close friend of mine called Manna Srinivasan, who used to write for Shruti magazine. He was a scholar who lived in Delhi. And every year he would go to Tirvayar uh, for the Tyagaraja Aradhana. He came back with a copy of Bengaluru Nagaratnamma's will. And he said, mm -hmm. uh, have you got a copy of this? I was quite surprised because I had not told anybody that I was writing a, a biography. And he okay. said, uh, keep this. And it, it ran into several pages. I still have it somewhere at home. And uh, nice. I realized that that would make a very good starting point because it showed what a uh, you know careful woman she had been on her finances, something that uh, had not occurred to several of her contemporaries, most of whom had died in absolute poverty. Right. And uh, this woman was so uh, careful in her savings, her investments. It spoke of a very different kind of a mindset altogether. And that really inspired me to take it up. And then Dr. Ramakausalya, who still lives in Tirneidanam, which is the next village to Tirvayaru, and is also a member of the uh, Committee of Experts at the Music Academy. She uh, said that the and that Nagaratnamas, the man who strummed her tampura, he was still alive in 2005. Uh, he was around 95. And Nagaratnamma's coachman, the one who took her to various places, he was alive and they were both living in Tirvayar. And she said, you come down, you stay with me, spend a couple of days and you interview them. That was a big uh, motivation. So I went immediately. I spent a couple of days with her, interviewed these two men who were very alert and cogent at 95. Memory was absolutely sharp. There was Chellamayar who had been a resident of Tirvayar. He died just a few years ago at 100 plus. And mm -hmm. uh, he he had a very different view of Bengaluru Nagaratnama. He was not very approving of all that she did. So he was okay. not uh, hero worshipping her or any such thing. And uh, so he uh, was also available. And so like this, you know, there were people. It was a good time to take up the book. Some people who knew her were still alive. Mr. V.A.K. Rangarao, who is a great scholar of uh, hey. gramophone records, Yes. He's possibly one of the world's largest collectors. He's got a collection of 48,000 of them. He's here. Uh, he's a very dear friend of mine. He had met Nagaratnama personally. He had several stories to talk about her. So like this, the book gradually expanded. And uh, one day I went to uh, Sampradaya to listen to Bani Bai's Harikatha, Rukmini Kalyanam. And it was only then that I realized that Bani Bai would always talk about Bengaluru Nagaratnama at one point or the other in the Harikatha because... She, to her, uh, you know, Bengaluru Nagaratnama was like a mother. And mm -hmm. in this Rukmini Kalyanam Harikatha, she stops in the middle and she says, people have forgotten Bengaluru Nagaratnama, but one day somebody will write her book. And I was so stunned by that announcement in a recording that I just stopped that Harikatha and I came home. I couldn't listen to it after that. I was frightened. It was almost as though somebody was speaking from far beyond the grave. Why should it be that I should pick up that particular recording on that particular day and I should listen to it? And five minutes into the recording, Bani Bai should make this comment that someday somebody will write and uh, Nagarat Nama's story. Right. And uh, Dr. Premila Gurmurthy, who was head of the Department of Music, she had learned from Bani Bai. She gave okay. me Bani Bai's biography of Nagarat Nama, which was four pa eight pages. It was a small booklet, uh, size okay. of my palm, not beyond mm -hmm. that in okay. Tamil. And uh, all these things kind of helped me to slowly begin writing the uh, book. It took three years uh, to complete. Uh, so I started it in 2005 and then I think I finished it in 2008. It, it still remains one of my favorite books. I have written several books after that. Several, several, several. Some things on corporate biography, something on the city, something here, there, everywhere. But Nagarat Nama to me still remains a very special uh, book. So there is a call from the past uh, coming into the present that actually gave you a, a direction as well. That's very, uh, very, very, say, you should say, this is possibly Bharatiya, that uh, you have, say, uh, samskaras, which are actually, say, transported across times. This is an excerpt mm. from uh, your book. Uh, so this is uh, one of the last chapters where you mention, in 1949, it was decided by the Tyagaraja Aradhana Committee that musicians ought to sing together by way of homage to Tyagaraja when worship was offered at the Samadhi on Aradhana Day. Five songs of the composer in the ragas, Nata, Gaula, 
Arabi, Varali, and Sri. So the uh, uh, now called the Pancharatnams were rendered for the first time at the Aradhana by all the musicians. Uh, for the sake of our viewers, the uh, Pancharatna Kritis of Tyagaraja, Jagadananda Karaka, Duduku Gada, Sadhinchane Manasa, Kanakana Ruchira, and Endaro Mahan Paulu. Prior to this, Nagaratnama was given the honor of singing as verse. I'm continuing from uh, Sri Ramji's book. Uh, prior to this, Nagaratnama was given the honor of singing as verse the 108 names of Tyagaraja that she had composed. And as she sang, she performed the Kumbharati. It was exactly what a Devadasi would do at the temple to which she was dedicated. And Nagaratnama, who had never been dedicated to any shrine, was now performing the same ritual at Tyagaraja's shrine. The government had banned the custom, but in a temple that was owned by her, nobody could object to what she was doing. This paragraph, uh, Sri Ramji, in a sense, uh, captures a kind of uh, number of questions that I intend to put to you in the context of our further discussion. So, in fact, when I thought of this discussion, one of the thoughts that I had is, uh, should we call this the reclamation of Devadasi to Bhava? Understanding Vidya Sundari, Bengaluru Nagratnama, Vidya Sundari being one of the Viruda of Bengaluru Nagratnama. And uh, another possibility was Vidya Sundari, Bengaluru Nagratnama, the Devadasi who sought and found her Swami. So it is in this context that I'd like to ask you how do you, in your vast number of conversations with several people of uh, you mentioned you already spoke to people who were 95 year old with very clear memories. And you also had traveled across several places and meeting such people, specifically from the artist communities. Could you please share how should we understand Devadasi Parampara and what are the multiple paramparas of Devadasis that we could understand? Because currently there's a lot of uh, rather say hazy understanding of Devadasi Parampara. See, one is uh, you start at a very uh, ancient point in time, say uh, you start from, uh, say, from the time of the Pallavas, which is when you first, uh, even earlier actually, because if you read the Silapati Karam of uh, Ilaggo Adigal, which tells us the life of Kannagi, it speaks of a very evolved tradition of uh, women being uh, trained as musicians and dancers. Uh, Madhavi, who Kanna, who basically uh, becomes the mistress of Kovalan, the hero of Kannagi, uh, she is a Devadasi herself, as you can make out uh, right. in the book. And uh, there is a very elaborate chapter which deals with uh, the training of uh, these Dasis and uh, the honors that they received when they performed. Right. Similarly, in the uh, 7th century, there are inscriptions in the Kansipur in Kansipuram in certain temples which speak of the dedication of so many women uh, to the shrine, identification of their names. Of course, the best known uh, inscription is in the 11th century in Brihadishwara temple in Tanjabur, where Rajaraja writes the names of all the women whom he has picked up from various temples and brought them, transferred them to the Tanjabur Brihadishwara shrine. And therefore, it indicates that this tradition had been in existence for several years, even prior to the Cholas, the Pallavas. And uh, it, is, it is not even an Indian tradition. You find that it's a world tradition. So mm -hmm. you had the same concept in Greece. You had the same concept in uh, Egypt, in several other places. Yeah. Gishas, of course, is a slightly different kind of a culture. But yes, you can broadly put them all together. So uh, what you find is that this concept of dedication of women existed. I'm not uh, passing judgment on whether it was good or bad. I'm just saying Understand. as a matter of fact that it existed. And initially, it would appear in India at least that, uh, and strangely, and I'm not qualified to comment on why, it appears to have proliferated in the coastal region of India. So it starts from Orissa or so. And then it comes down all the way up to Tamil Nadu. For some reason, Kerala didn't have a very strong Devadasi tradition. But then again, when you go up the coast to Goa and Maharashtra and all that, you find that it did exist to a certain mm -hmm. extent. The uh, women were dedicated. 
initially it would appear that women were dedicated across a uh, community so it was not a caste based system people would pray that uh, they would dedicate their daughter maybe the women dedicated themselves so you know in tirupati in tirumala i think there is the story of a pallava princess who voluntarily dedicated herself to the temple sometime mm -hmm. in the 6th or 7th century if i am not mistaken so we have instances of women from various communities uh, who became dasis they they just dedicated themselves to the temple thereafter they performed services in the temple and they lived there that was it right. uh over a period of time this appears to have resulted in everything uh, you know all practices eventually become codified rigid and uh, then there is no breaking out of it and over a period of time the surround or the environment ensures that the rigidity of the system is preserved and lot of vested interests also uh, come into these things so uh, firstly this was a system whereby the uh, women had certain rights because of their responsibilities so mm -hmm. you had uh, because they had duties to perform they also received certain privileges right. so uh, for instance they were considered to be married to the deity the deity whether it was male or female it did not matter right. but they were married to the deity so this pottu katra is important uh, ritual at a certain age in the girl's life when she she would be married to the lord the 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 dot which is the pottu which she will mm -hmm. get from the temp, the deity will be tied on her neck either by the priest or by the eldest woman in the community and okay. thereafter she would become a devar adiyal which is the handmaiden of the god okay. that's it she would receive food she would receive clothing they would receive houses because of the duties that they had to perform mm -hmm. and eventually when they died the funeral pyre would be lit from the kitchen of the temple and okay. on that day the temple will be closed in ritual mourning because the lord had lost a consort and the last okay. garment that the devadasi would wear would be the dress that the deity would be wearing on that day they would take it okay. off and place it on the body of the dasi and then you know send mm -hmm. her off for cremation so yes. this is how this is how it was uh, done all very noble on paper now mm -hmm. the question is that because the dasis of a Uh, uh, having certain duties and responsibilities raja raja himself says that it is them it is up to them to train the next generation so it the onus was on them to keep the culture going therefore they had to have children now where do you get children you have to cohabit right. with a priest or you have cohabit with a temple administrator or with a princely patron or an aristocrat or somebody and thereafter they would have children mm -hmm. and uh, the girls were preferred because the property and the and the talent was all going down mother to daughter mother to daughter mother to daughter so the right. males were not uh, very uh, important if you uh, ask me so this was in right. sharp contrast to what was happening in society at large because in society at large it was the boy child that was preferred the devadasi was the exception because the devadasi was a free woman she did not have mm -hmm. to take her husband's name the children took her name she had no widowhood she was educated she knew multiple languages she could sing she could dance she could express herself in writing and she had right to property which she passed on to her children without any interference from the husband so this was a very uh, unique system if you ask me so in a society that was completely dominated by men this was a counter that uh, existed and while everywhere else women were expected to be chaste and modest this was a line where the dharma was not to have chastity right the this was their duty they they were ordained not to be chaste this is what bengaluru nagaratnama herself writes in her preface to radhika santvanamo she says it is our dharma right. not to be chaste this is our line this is how we are so it was a very different kind of a situation and it required in fact, in that Uh, yeah may i trap that in that if i recall it right she also mentions natya shastra and refers to apsaras right from uh, the beginning and that, that parampara is actually indicated not as something which is uh, only haloka but it starts from uh, parloka itself yeah the thing is the so this was how people like her viewed the system 
and uh, you know the there were a lot of uh, as i said the temple administrators the priests they were all equally keen that the system should continue but the problem is that the system was subject to a lot of misuse see as long as the king was powerful and there was powerful administration everything went off well the women were right. paid their dues they got what they wanted they were respected now the moment the kings became weak when you know what is traditionally worded as dharma becomes weak Right. A lot of adharma comes in. And then these were the first women to be exploited in the line. So mm -hmm. towards the 18th and the 19th century, when, you know, kingship in India was uh, weak and uh, everything was being exploited, the Devadasis were the first people to suffer in a very big way. Secondly, what we also interpret as the glories of the Devadasi system is because of a select few about whose lives we know. Okay. Whom do we know about? We know about Veena Dhanamma. We know about Bengaluru Nagaratnamma, Coimbatore Thai, Tiruvarur Rajai, Salem Godavari. These were all Balasaraswati. the stars. Balasaraswati much later. Balasaraswati is 1920s, 30s and all. I am talking about the okay. early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Balasaraswati was after all Dhanamma's granddaughter. So we are not even looking at her generation. We are looking at that generation. So we are only looking at the stars. We are not looking at the rest. Secondly, you take our own lives, for example. How many of us are taught music when we start off? Hundreds. How many of us continue in music? Very few. Very few. How many of us have interest in it thereafter? Ones. Maybe it's a 0.001% which makes it as a massive star and the rest of them are mediocrities. And then there are several who have fallen by the wayside. So the Devadasi system became so rigid that the women had no freedom. If they didn't have talent to sing and dance, they had no earning capability. Yet they were forced mm -hmm. into this. So they were being exploited. And when they could not make money out of singing and dancing, what do they do? They are not taught anything else. So I don't have to mention it, where they went. Right. So this became the big bane. And lots of women, as they saw, see, once upon a time, they were free. Now they began to see women from other communities being free, getting educated in convents, becoming doctors, becoming this, that and sundry. And they were being denied all that. And the men mm -hmm. hated the system from day one because they had no powers. They okay. wanted freedom. They wanted to dominate over the women. And they thought that this. So ultimately there was and came Victorian morals where, you know, the very communities that had supported the Devadasi system for years, now suddenly turned around at them and declared them to be evil. Because you, you take 1862 when the High Court of Madras came into existence, almost the first cases to be tried pertain to Devadasis. And the judges mm -hmm. who were there, they were either they were British or later they were Indians who were trained in the British jurisprudence. There is no word in English like Devadasi. The only right. word that they had was prostitute, which is not what the Devadasis were. Right. So, they were branded as that. And therefore, public perception, yeah, they are evil. So, you know, the men who encouraged the Devadasi tradition, the other upper castes, etc., etc., they suddenly became holier than thou and the women became the most evil. Uh, it's very convenient, fact, right? It's a very tragic right. story. And, and in uh, sense, uh, uh, sir, if I may interrupt, I noticed that, say, the word prostitute, even in hmm. English language, has had a different meaning from uh, what we understand today in the sense that Whoever was not a, a wife of a, 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 a regular family, a wife in a regular family, uh, because she is not part of that, she is outside of it. Therefore, uh, she is a prostitute. And the sense that I am not aware of this uh, classification, but I am okay. only going by the conventional, modern right. interpretation of what that word is. And uh, uh, so, you know, when Dr. Muthulakshmi Reddy came up with the uh, with the with the uh, how shall I build? demand that uh, the system be outlawed. Several of the Devadasis themselves became her supporters because they wanted to get out of the system. Perhaps the most uh, famous woman in that line and a person about whom I did not know when I wrote this book, otherwise I would have dedicated a full chapter to her, was a lady called Muvalur Ramamrita Mammal, who, who was born in the Devadasi line but fought the Devadasi system, got married to a man, refused to get the portal done hated it, carried forward an active propaganda against the system, pointed out its evils, became a member of the Dravidian 
parties fought for uh, their electoral rights and became as much an icon as Bengaluru Nagaratna Madhi. Okay. So, you know, there was a very different uh, interpretation as well. And we have to recognize that. And the majority, okay. there were letters written to the press, which I read in the archives, where people were by and large from the community itself. They were vehemently opposed to the continuity of the uh, tradition. I ultimately came to the conclusion that women like Nagaratnama were living in an ivory tower because they were very successful. They had a lot of money. They were, you know, they 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 believed in the art in a very big way, and uh, which is very nice. But they were not representing the voice of the majority. But they banded together. They formed the Devadasi Association. They tried to fight against the uh, outlawing. What nobody uh, realized in the end was that the government deals with these things in a very different way government passes a legislation and at that time remember this is pre-independent india there was no supreme court so uh, right. you can't go on appeal against something that a state government has passed the right. madras legislative council passed the prevention of notch and the anti devadasi bill and uh, with that it had came to be law today you cannot outlaw a community like that uh, we live in better times, in my opinion. There are far more right. avenues for appeal, uh, for right. representation. And uh, right. while I agree that a woman like Nagaratnama was not right in demanding that the system be allowed to perpetuate itself, she was quite right in one paragraph in that demand where she wrote, give us time to reform ourselves. You say right. that we are evil. Okay. If that is so, so be it. She doesn't agree with it, but she is quoting them. She's saying that you, know, right. you say that we are evil, fine. But give our children time to become doctors, right. lawyers, etc. Educate them. Why right. do you want to outlaw the system so quickly? So give it time. But that they are not willing to give. And they pass the bill. They think mm -hmm. that the temples will give the rights in perpetuity to the Devadasis. The men think that the temples will give it to them. Ultimately, nobody gets it. The temples just Very throw out story of women from service and keep the properties to themselves. And there is they, they lose bitterly. And today, and you know, when we yeah. And that's actually a tragic story of a bureaucratic state, which uh, you would not expect in a uh, kingly monarchy. Because the king is certain and in the uh, dharmic king. Ultimately, these women were thrown out. They, they, they and their children were left with a lot of bitterness and hate towards the art that they had supported and saved for so many years. And they walked out of it completely. Today, you know, we talk about Carnatic music and Bharatanatyam being the preserve of Brahmins and the upper castes. This was the first blow when the very art that they had sustained for so long suddenly turned against them. They walked out of it. And thereafter, they were not going to come back. And that alienated a huge community of people who were actually professing uh, those arts. It was a very big tragedy. Anyway, so. While these uh, the times have been in a manner where uh, things have been going against the uh, parampara of Devadasis, not only because uh, within the community, the possibilities of how they can explore their own life being uh, constrained. One, as you mentioned, every ritual after a point in time becomes morbid. It doesn't know how to uh, say, uh, realize what is the reason why the ritual exists. And this is true of probably all kinds of uh, rituals that exist across the board. In such a state, let me go back to the first point that you mentioned about, say, the Parampara's continuation, where the Devadasi had an opportunity to anoint who shall be the next Devadasi that shall continue, continue the tradition. And uh, this could have happened on one hand, uh, as you mentioned, somebody voluntarily dedicating themselves, or they begetting children by uh, cohabiting someone and uh, in this cohabitation, uh, a question that I thought uh, may be relevant is, uh, uh, was there any kind of a code that, in terms of how they choose who to cohabit and who not? Was it something which was existent in the sense that you might as well say you want to cohabit somebody who is Sreshtha, so that you might as well say uh, get the uh, child who might as well be 
the desired fruit that you're looking at is there something of that kind that you've noticed anywhere no the uh, the 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 money is what really played a huge role in the whole thing the wealthiest patron usually okay. bid for the uh, the what was called the deflowering ceremony and uh, thereafter so that is how it uh, went on so as i said it was highly exploitative the girls certainly had no choice in uh, what they were getting into but uh, it was a uh, uh, you know the, it may have been very great in some mythical past but it was a racket uh, towards the close of the 18th and the 19th century nagaratnama herself writes about how there was a noble of the mysore court who was greatly interested in her and uh, there was a music master who was very keen to make money in the process but right. it was yeah. her guru who saved her right. she says that they were uh, the guru saved her from these two malefic planets this is the word right. that she uses these two evil grahas grahas right. that is how that is Rahu the term Kedu. that she yeah she she uses so right. uh, she knew and she was very shrewd very very shrewd but if you ask me about this choice of patron and uh, whether uh, he was a shrestha uh, the you look at some of the uh, you look at two examples uh, or even three for that matter or uh, so uh, you have uh, vina dhanama for whom dhanama was uh, to dhanama you know money and uh, monetary well being and uh, temporal benefits meant nothing for her art was everything art had to be great and whoever was her patron had to appreciate he had to be a, 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 a more than that it was something else it was uh, I, I, the word just fails me you know he had to be okay. as much worthy of her as uh, she was of him so dhanama was uh, was a stickler for the highest standards and money just did not matter to dhanama so you know she selected people very carefully so dharmapuri subaraya the great composer was her patron for a long period of time prior to that there was the maharaja of vijayanagaram so you know she was very clear she uh, nagaratnama herself if you look at it right. uh, first there is uh, the maharaja of mysore himself but she was very young at that point of time then there is right. justice narahari rao right very scholarly elderly treating her with respect and uh, placing her on a pedestal then coming to madras where there is that sahukar rajaratna mudaliyar who teaches her all about finance which she picks up very well from him and uh, so you know she made her choices very very clear and uh, so it's amazing that uh, you know she uh, uh, came i mean she was like that much later even somebody like ms subalakshmi uh, mm-hmm. when she realized that sada sivam you know ultimately in the long run there is everything negative that is spoken about sadashivam and you know how he dominated over ms subalakshmi's life etc etc that's a different aspect but subalakshmi realized that sadashivam was a man who would give her a new lease of life who would place her on a pedestal and therefore she selected him as her patron as her husband and got married so you know that that again is just shows you that you know there were women who made their own choices it is not as though they uh, uh, just left it to the system and accepted anything uh, that was coming and such women benefited in every way because uh, they you know we remember them today and similarly movalur ramamrita mamal also we must remember uh, decided to get out of the system married somebody similarly there right. was sai mata shivabrinda devi who became a sanyasini rather than remain a devadasi she did not okay. want to she said i will become a woman of god so she really dedicated herself on a different plane altogether mm-hmm. so there are people like that so uh, this concept of shreshtha or you know the most befitting patron uh, has happened there is no doubt about it but i think by and large it's like uh, you know you can't write history only by looking at the inscriptions of the emperors because that's like uh, writing the history of a political party based on the posters that it is putting up on the walls every day so uh, you have to look at the other side of it as well so uh, just five or six uh, uh, if you write the history of cricket for instance you'll have gavaskar dravid tendulkar etc etc what about the millions who never made it but who were probably <laughs> just a little less talented so we don't know so right. uh, okay. i i suppose say uh, that is one possible reason why uh, uh, we've had itihasa which is understood quite differently from modern history 
in the sense that uh, when you write something about the past, you speak about dharma, artha, kava, moksha as something that has to be present in that. And it is here that I actually am uh, reminded of the portrayal of uh, uh, Devadasi Vyavastha by uh, Kavi Samrat Vishnath Satinarayana in his uh, famous book, uh, Vee Padagalu, where uh, you may have come across this. There's a translation oh. of this uh, work done by Sri P. V. Narasimha Rao to uh, Hindi by name Sahasrafan. So in that, uh, there is a Devadasi shown who attains moksha and uh, her path to moksha is actually portrayed and the novel actually is trying to convey about uh, what were all the great paramparas of yore and how they are actually on the wane as time is passing. And uh, then the, in the end, say, uh, the, uh, the entire uh, story is actually narrated uh, through the standpoint of one of the players by name Dharmarao, who says the flows are so strong that I cannot swim against the tide but I do not get swept off the tide also. So I stand and witness how the forces are moving and I'm able to narrate. And uh, it is through this narration that I've come to realize what is happening. And he goes on to say, the world seems to be moving as though that uh, everything new is uh, wonderful, great. If at all, it is indeed the ca uh, case that uh, that which is of yore is bad and that which is new is powerful and indeed great, then you can actually shun the past, embrace the new. But if the new is actually inferior and you accept it solely because uh, this is something that is uh, say to be, uh, to be taken in because it is new, that is the kind of a problem possibly that we are facing is a kind of uh, point that uh, he makes in that. So, while you see the Devdasi uh, formulation of one kind, I thought I should also uh, bring to your attention that in the year 2015, possibly the last Devdasi by name Sashimani Devi of uh, Jagannath yeah, she Puri, died. Mm. she passed away and uh, she decided not to anoint anybody. And that right. was a very significant kind of a decision that she made. Mm. I mean, she had every opportunity given that, say, by that time itself, your book was released and... Uh, I suppose say, there's also in the air the kind of relook at what ought to be this thing and possibly the uh, revision of it. But she made a choice, a very significant choice that uh, the parampara uh, at this moment is something that I put uh, a full stop to it. Or maybe say it should be a semicolon uh, that only time has to decide. To be specifically talking about Bengaluru Nagaratnama, uh, do you come across any parampara of Bengaluru Nagaratnama that can be traced back beyond, say, her mother and maybe uh, a little more? Nothing. She, in her will also, she only says that she is the daughter of Putulakshmi Dasi Vaishnavi of Hegede Devanna Kota. Beyond that, she does not say anything. And uh, there okay. is one uh, unverified, uh, I think BBK Shastri or somebody has written where they say that she... Um, they they were you know the mother was attached to the uh, this uh, temple outside Mysore. I'm uh, Na Nanjangur. Uh, he mm -hmm. says that the mother was a devadasi in the temple at Nanjangur, but Nagaratnama herself doesn't write it anyway. So uh, we don't have any. And Nagaratnama herself doesn't see she adopts a daughter, but then when that becomes uh, that you know that story goes sour for whatever. Okay. And that by the way, there's a lot of gray area in that. We have no idea what happened to that girl. Uh, some people say she died. Some people say Nagaratnama disowned her. Nobody knows exactly what happened. But it, all we can say is that she had nobody. And later she considers Banibai to be a kind of a spiritual uh, daughter to her. Daughter. But she does not appear to have taught Banibai anything. Because okay. Banibai's line was completely different. It was Harikatha. Whereas Nagaratnama was uh, dance and uh, singing and all that. And not so much Harikatha. So I don't think there was a, uh, any attempt by her to even perpetuate her line in the Devadasi tradition. If one were to understand, say, Bengaluru Nagaratnama and her own uh, respect for Parampara, there is a very fine uh, example that you give in your book on Kyagesa Kuravanji and uh, Kondi Kuttiyamal's fight for her inherited rights. That's a very fascinating thing that I found uh, in your book. See, the word Kondi itself means very determined. Uh, the uh, In the Tyagesha, the Tiruvarur Tyagaraja Swami temple is co often considered to be the birthplace of the Devadasi tradition. 
and uh, the legend goes that the lord was placed in his chariot and uh, was preparing to go in procession when the chariot wheels would not move the king of the region uh, was puzzled and then the devadasi uh, of the temple came out and she said that if i touch the wheels of the chariot they will start moving but uh, thereafter she will not live and uh, people are quite taken aback but she is so determined that the procession of tyagaraja should take place that she touches the wheels and then the temple chariot moves and she dies so the kondi comes from that story that she was so determined that she was even willing to give up her life in order to ensure that the procession of tyagesha continued and so in tiruvarur the uh, devadasis were given very exalted status i don't know if kamalam is still alive but around 15 20 years ago she was and she was the last practicing devadasi of the tiruvarur tyagesha temple she had of course had a career in uh, academics but every year during the time of the temple festival she would go there and then she would receive the traditional honors and she took great pride in the fact that she uh, belonged to that uh, tradition so uh, the word kondi comes from that and uh, they uh, had been honored greatly over a long 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 line you know several generations of uh, women and muthuswami dikshitar himself in his uh, composition uses the phrase vimala rudra ganika nartana priyena that is the lord delights in the dance of the rudra ganikas rudra ganikas was right. one of the classifications in the tiruvarur uh, devadasi tradition there was the tyagesha devadasis who were the rudra ganikas then there were the kamalamba devadasis then there were the nilotpalamba devadasis and all that so they were uh, dasis belonging to each sanctum so right. they were very important in uh, in, mm -hmm. in tiruvarur and uh, the uh, they had the tyagesha kuravanji which was uh, their right to perform in the courtyard of the uh, tyagaraja swami temple now nagaratnamma is a newcomer in that area and mm -hmm. the thing about nagaratnamma is that you know she is that typical competitive woman right through life she is competitive she is forever itching for a fight with somebody or the other if it is mm -hmm. not uh, kandukuri veere selingam then it is muthu lakshmi reddy if it is not muthu lakshmi reddy i am sure there must have been a whole lot of sabha secretaries who must have uh, suffered uh, at her hands then there is the recording industry if then you know she uh, she is fighting for this tyagaraja aradhana so she is a woman who is always looking out for causes that she can espouse and because she is also so successful that she is so confident about herself that she does not view challenges as something to be afraid about mm -hmm. and uh, so she has arrived in this area and uh, at that point of time her patron is vadapadi mangalam uh, who is this one of the famous vadapadi mangalam family i think somasundar mudiliar or uh, i don't know if it is uh, this one uh, yagaraj mudiliar or somasundar mudiliar i think somasundar mudiliar and uh, you know the uh, they owned at one point of time land even more than the tyagaraja swami temple in that area even today they are very major uh, land holders uh, in that area mm -hmm. and uh, sugar mills uh, and all kinds of things and at okay. one point of time they owned more land in tiruvarur than the tyagesha temple so they actually gave their land to the temple so that the temple will have more land than what no land have. Right. and uh, they diverted the river to pass through their estate so that the women of the family could have a bath there they were that kind of powerful patrons so nagaratnama right. becomes very uh, close to one of them and uh, because of that because they were the hereditary trustees of the tiruvarur tyagaraja swami temple she says why should i not perform the tyageshu kuravanji in what why should it be the rights of that family alone and that is where right. this whole uh, challenge comes up and she does not realize that the kondis are equally determined women they are not going to give up on anything right. so kutiyamma decides to challenge the right of uh, nagaratnam Nagaratna. finally nagaratnam is taught a lesson in humility that you cannot fight everywhere and you have to respect some things in tradition and you have to leave it and then she gives in with good grace uh, thereafter and maybe that is really the beginning of the mellowing of nagaratnam Uh, uh, that's a, a turning point. Is uh, in fact uh, the marshalling of facts that you do in your book. It actually gives you, uh, say, a possibility for uh, reading it 
uh, interpreting in uh, in a ways where say you can start reading more than what is actually apparent and that's something which is a very special kind of a, a quality that i found in uh, almost all of your books uh, i don't know about that because i didn't put it in that way this, as i say ultimately oh, i am only an instrument if nagaratnama wants that book to be written see na, you know i'll tell you one thing i have come to realize i am an intensely spiritual religious person myself and i believe that these carnatic musicians who write through their life whether they like it or not they are chanting the name of god so often that they are not ordinary people at all and therefore they have a certain penumbra or a, a kind of a how aura. should i put it an aura of a sphere of influence that right. exceeds their time their physical time and it 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 exists for a long period of time see we are we say that even hiranyakashipu got moksha ultimately because he was always thinking about vishnu well so he was abusing vishnu all the time he was thinking about vishnu so yeah, these are all not ordinary people so i right. still believe that nagaratnama was extraordinary and she may have written the book if i had not written it someone else would have written it that's it okay it's just that it came so, to me that's all so uh, as in one reason why i actually mentioned this is uh, when we use the term parampara it's primarily of two kinds uh, one is your bindu parampara that is your parental uh, uh, hmm. say parampara then the other is guru shishya parampara so on the one hand when you speak about an art form you primarily speak about who is your guru so in so far as say tracing the parampara of uh, devadasi is concerned one may say that uh, each particular temple has a parampara of its own and uh, like say so i agree way, possibly we can start so so uh, how do we how do you see say a study of uh, this say uh, knowledge parampara so in sangeeta I, i suppose say more or less there is a very established way in which you find this parampara recognition quite there do you see that possible in in say the uh, natya and uh, temple dance it is too late for that because the concept of temple dance was killed with one blow in 1927 28 thereafter temple dance was banned outlawed it then had to <clears throat> come back with women of other communities taking it now that is a very uh, uh, how shall i put it a very sensitive uh, chapter you can look at it two ways so on the one hand the devadasis were out and uh, people like e krishnayar and others they felt that uh, dance had to be reformed within inverted quotes now what reformation Uh, i don't understand that so they believed that if the dance was performed by a dasi it was evil but if the dance was performed by a person of a different community then it was not and therefore you know women from other communities were encouraged to take to the art form and uh, the uh, you know the, the there were certain songs that were even eschewed saying that you know this is not suitable this is suitable so you suddenly somebody is sitting in judgment over kshetra uh, parampara yeah over many kshetra <laughs> parampara you know sometimes i think that uh, most people don't understand telugu carnatic musicians particularly they so they just sing then when you read it it's fantastic so i've been reading balantra purajnik antaraus uh, i keep it with me all the time every now and then i i, I find that book to be fascinating mm-hmm. he kshetra had a different relationship with god ultimately it's uh, it's amazing annamaya had that kind right. of relation with god as well jayadeva had it oh True. what the sringa kirtan yes yeah yeah we don't need better examples than these people you know at the end of the day but then suddenly these people True. came along and they decided that uh, you know they had to sit in judgment so what is good what is bad etc etc then the dance came back into the temples in a different way you had chidambaram natyanjali so you know on one hand there is still a law that forbids dancing in the temples on the other hand right. dancing is now allowed in the temple so and prostitution goes on merrily in other in you know it, it has gone on it is one of the right so as a instance right so in a sense say uh, we are a society where say we aren't able to uh, put all things in a manner where uh, uh, they can actually make sense we have multiple things happening in a manner where say things are not sitting well 
So yeah, but there I, I would like to point out not put in. Yeah, but I would like to point out one thing that the great good that happened was you were not compulsorily thrusting girls without their choice into that profession. So that had gone. So that freedom to the woman had been vouchsafed. It had been assured. So no question of thrusting somebody into a profession that they were not comfortable with. So there is on one hand the question that the other communities appropriated the dance and they began to dance. That is very much, it's a, I agree 100% that there is this charge of appropriation does stick. So the, it, is, it is there that you, know, you, you, you said that one community cannot do it. Then you took it and then you gave it to the others. But you know, if you look at it differently, it also democratized the art because everybody but, uh, could dance. No, I understand. Nobody... But, uh, uh, but the question would also be that the kind of dedication that people had uh, in a particular parampara. I mean, this is something that we might we are better understanding in music, uh, in the sense that you can possibly find, uh, say, you can separate wheat from chaff uh, much easier uh, because of the maybe say stricter standards uh, or because the parampara is still alive when it comes to music. Uh, no, I dance... tell you, I have a, you, okay. you've kind of uh, uh, raised a topic on which I can go on for the next 10 days if necessary. I have very strong views on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. What happened essentially is mm -hmm. that dance became <clears throat> a hobby for the women and men to a less extent, but women certainly, mm -hmm. of the upper classes. So it was something that they could take to, oh, my child is learning Bharatanatyam, excellent. Then you perform an Arangetram where you spend millions on the Arangetram. Today, I am told that the average budget for a high society Arangetram can be as much as 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs. Right. After that, what happens? Nothing. That invitation no card, which is that invitation card, which is printed for that arangetram, makes it look as though that child is a Bala Saraswati in the making, or a Rukmini Devi, or a Kumari in the making. After right. that, you never hear of this girl. Everybody True. goes, they witness all the friends of the parents of the children. They come and clap. They have a good dinner. They, they get a take-home gift, and then they go home. The whole thing is a sham. And ultimately, what is and that is on one side. Now, music, on the other hand, is still a meritocracy. You can conduct an arangetram in music by inviting all your friends. But the second and the third performance and so on, you cannot be inviting the same friends again and again. Ultimately, your voice and your performing skills on the instrument will have to stick. You have to attract the audience on your own. No sabha is going to be willing to get you to come and sit again and again just because your father is rich. Dance, on the other hand, has gone into that morass. It is, it has completely lost it, in my opinion. And there are very few dancers today who are viewing it as a career where that is their only source of income. Unless you view it as your source of income, unless there is an economic motive and you can live only on the basis of the profession that you profess to take, you cannot succeed in it. There has to be fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. You cannot say that, you know, I am very rich. I will do this as a hobby. Then it remains a hobby. Right. And hobby, unfortunately, in, in every, you know, hobby by its very definition is not a profession. A doctor cannot be a doctor by hobby. An right. architect or a construction engineer cannot be a construction engineer by hobby. His building will collapse. He has to have certain grounding. A businessman right. cannot have business as a hobby. Similarly, a dancer cannot survive by keeping dance as a hobby. You have to take it as a profession. Musicians, those who take it as a profession, succeed. And if they have the fire in the belly, see, the problem with the art, performing arts is that they're a very difficult line to get into. Only the gutsiest and the most persevering of people can get into it. And even then, good luck may not be with you. You may suffer right. physical problems. You may suffer voice-related issues. The great Bala Saraswati had rheumatoid arthritis and had heart problems. What, see, what misfortune. Such a great dancer. And she could not move. She had put on weight. She had problems. People made fun. Who knew the agony that that woman was going through? Right. This is the issue. Today, if a musician cancels a performance three days running, 
there are people who will spread the rumor our guys point to sir our cancer on the anything they will say right this is the tragedy of the performing arts this is one tragedy the other mm -hmm. great tragedy is what is the money that we give these people can they afford to live by performing the you know the you look at the the rates that they get from the sabhas the uh, i uh, you know uh, I, i the less said the better i am a sabha secretary myself so i am not going to say it but carnatic music and bharatanatyam have a tradition where this whole impact of thyagaraja he lived a life of poverty everybody else need you see we are not thyagarajas that is why thyagaraja is thyagaraja so i mean i i, I can uh, i can possibly share one very interesting discussion that i had with a nityagni hotran recently so uh, so he mentioned according to manusmriti the best life for a brahmana is to be an aswasthanika aswasthanika being a technical word which primarily means that uh, you do not store any grain for the next meal this is so very nice now that is a kind of no no uh, in fact the uncha vritti that tyagaraja undertook All is nice. stated to be that uh -huh. but i am actually speaking to nityagni hotran and the nityagni hotran categorically says a nityagni hotri has an agnihotra to uh, maintain and uh, yeah, he, he has to maintain the fire no exactly, exactly. and so, he cannot uh, be an asvastanika uh -huh. so is the whole thing and now you know imagine if the same uncha vritti brahmin was coming every day to my doorstep first day i will give second day i will give third day i will give for they i'll say why the hell am i going to keep let him go to the next house this is the problem so right. tyagaraja was a different story altogether and you know we have kind of magnified the tyagaraja story to a point where there is very little reality left in it but that's a different that's a topic for another discussion right you can't expect today's carnatic musicians to live like that they have children who have to be educated why should they not aspire to go by car why should they not aspire to live a live comfortably why should they not go by flight from one place to other or stay in a good quality hotel there's nothing should to prevent them but unfortunately it is considered to be a virtue to be poor in carnatic music or in and bharatanatyam is a shade worse because what happens ultimately is in an, in carnatic music if you pay x amount which is already low to one singer a violinist and a mridangist you pay the same money to a bharatanatyam performance which has got a main dancer who has got a lot of investment to do in makeup and jewelry and costume then right. she has got he or she has got a whole lot of accompanists who are much more than what you have got on a vocal platform or in a music platform they get the same money at the end of it most dancers have to be well to do if they have to perform because they have got to pump in their own money to keep their career going now that is right. not the way an art form can survive at the end of the day my concern now post covid is that carnatic music is going down the same tube it remains a meritocracy there is no doubt about it audiences are very exacting about what they want but audiences don't want to pay they want all performances to be free this has been a tradition in chennai particularly the so called mecca of carnatic music that people want performances to be free they don't buy tickets sabhas also encourage this whole thing you know you say i want to buy a ticket how can we ask you for a ticket you just come all are welcome all are welcome all are welcome who pays ultimately for these performances some sponsor pays the sabha then gives the money to the artist now over a period of time particularly post this covid and with carnatic music jumping into this virtual world and putting everything free there are people who say please attend my concert immediately down below on social media please send youtube link people who at least took the effort to go to a sabha they have become so lazy that they want to view it from their home on a youtube link in the midst of doorbell ringing pressure cooker whistling courier coming they will have the attention span of an ant 5 minutes also they will not be listening to the performance it has become the Uh, uh i don't know what you call it deteriorated or uh, it has it has reached a real low level when it comes to audience respect for the performing art what where is the money has everybody forgotten economics uh in a sense say uh, we do uh, uh, speak of sakhradeyas uh and uh, society of sakhradeya is going to be the best society is a artistic uh, claim which has a very great truth in it and uh, how do we create a society of sakhradeyas is a very key question which uh, temple dances of your and the 
Vidhi Natakas, the uh, street plays, and uh, Harikatha, all these performances, they actually achieved that kind of a society where you could say Subhiksha, which means say Bhiksha is in plenty, that possibility existed. And modern societies are more or less say much removed from that kind of a uh, uh, imagination. See and the word the patronage. Way. So right. you you know a Saraswati Bai was getting 450 rupees for a performance in 1910-1912. 450 rupees. Okay. Yeah. That's a very big amount in those days. GNB was drawing 1000 rupees in the 1940s. What are we hmm. giving our artists today? In comparison, where is inflation? So patronage, as you say very rightly, was very important. There were people who were willing to extend their patronage to temple perform performances, to Harikatha performances, to Vithi Natakam, as you rightly pointed out. All of these survived at that point of time. Today, what is happening is that the patron is expecting the performance to be given for free. Do you have any say reason why you see this kind of a degradation happen? As in, in because, because you this has become artists, one of many so entertainment forms. People are not viewing the classical arts as an art form that requires sustenance. They are viewing it just like anything else. But when they go to a hotel, they spend five thousand rupees if necessary for a dinner for two. When you go, when they go to a cinema theater, they spend 2,000 rupees if necessary for a cinema viewing for two people, including all the popcorns and everything. But when it comes to a classical art performance, why should it be given for free? Right. Uh, Nagaratnama to come back, if she had been around, would not have allowed this nonsense. To I love this. Right. Uh, I uh, request you to say, spend some time on uh, Tyagaraja Arathana, the beginning of it. Because that's one very significant aspect that uh, you raise in your book. Uh, so, in fact, that entire uh, narration of Chinakachi, Pedakachi, and how it actually unfolded. In fact, uh, say uh, it, it appeared as though say that is the soul of the kind of uh, construct that you bring in in the life and times of uh, Bengaluru Nagaratnama. So, yeah. the so, Siagraja died in 1847. And right. uh, he was a, he took Apat Sanyasa. That is, at the end of his life, in the last three or four days of his life, he became a sannyasin. And uh, as befitting a sannyasin, he was buried. And uh, Brindavanam was constructed on top of the spot where he was buried. Now, he was not buried in isolation. That particular area was a vast open space where sannyasis had been buried repeatedly. And on each of them, a Brindavanam would be erected, a memorial with a Tulasi growing on it, would be erected. So, Tyagaraja was not unique. Today, we think of him as unique over there. That is because of what we have done. But if we had gone there 200 years ago, we would have been hard put to find which was Tyagaraja's Samadhi because there would have been hundreds of other Samadhis over there. The, the Kaveri there is supposed to be as sacred as the Ganga. And uh, people, when they were dying, would be taken and left in touch with the water. And they would die there. They would be cremated. If they were sannyasis, then they would be buried. So this is how it was. Tyagaraja was buried. And after that, every year, his grandson, his daughter's son, Panchapakesaya, also known as Tyagaraja, he performed the Aradhana. To, for a saint, you, don't, you do an Aradhana. So he, he performed the Aradhana till he died at the age of 32 or 33 or something like that in the 1850s. He had no children. And his wife, Guru Amma, took the idols of Rama that Tyagaraja was, Rama, Sita, Lakshmana, Hanuman, that uh, Tyagaraja was worshipping and moved back to her paternal home, which was in Tanjapur. And after that, the connection with the uh, with Tirvayar ceased. So there was nobody left in the Tyagaraja uh, family uh, line. But his brother's family, you know, the so-called evil brother, Japyesa, who really did not exist. There, was, there were two brothers, uh, Panchanadaya and Panchapakesaya. And one of their sons, and incidentally, both those brothers were dead by the time Tyagaraja died. You know, in the cinema tradition, right. they always show Tyagaraja's elder brother. Imagine Tyagaraja himself was 80. The brother must have been 90, but he is still shown right. as a youngish man. So anyway, yes. <laughs> let's not get into all that. So uh, Tyagaraja's brother's family was still living in the house next door to the Samadhi. That was there. Now, the disciples, 
యూనో త్యాగరాజ ఆసధీర దూరదేశమున ప్రకాశము చేసిన రసిక శిరోమణి ఇన్ దాశరథి హీ టెల్స్ రామా దట్ యూ హ్యావ్ మేడ్ మీ ఫేమస్ ఇన్ ఫార్ ఆఫ్ ల్యాండ్స్ టు మై సాటిస్ఫాక్షన్ సో ఈ వెన్ హీ వాజ్ అలైవ్ హీ వాజ్ అ సెలబ్రిటీ పీపుల్ హిస్ డిసైపుల్స్ వర్ ఆల్ ఓవర్ ఇండియా they were singing his songs and so they were conducting the aradhanas at their respective uh, places Place. this is all early in the 1900s the last two surviving disciples of tyagaraja see they were only 10 and 12 when tyagaraja passed away so they were still alive in 1906 1907 umayalpuram krishna bhagavatar and sundara bhagavatar they come down and with great difficulty they identify which is the samadhi of tyagaraja by the time you know forest has grown over those places the stone work has broken somehow they identified and we have to accept that they identified tyagaraja samadhi correctly they, right. we have to face facts right. there are lots of ifs and buts in this story and there is also a legend that they put their ear to the ground and heard ramanama coming and that is how they <laughs> identified the samadhi now for all my religiosity i don't believe a word of that but uh, i yes they did That's identify the sam- <laughs> they identified the samadhi of tyagaraja yeah and they put up a plaque over there saying that they had renovated it and uh, thereafter their disciples krishna that is uh, tillai sthanam narasimha bhagavatar and panchu bhagavatar they were two brothers they designed that they should conduct the aradhana in tiruvayyar itself so tyagaraja died in 1847 this is only in 1907 1908 that we finally find a revival and a tr- this decision being taken that we will conduct the aradhana in tiruvayyar so narasimha bhagavatar is a very uh, successful harikatha performer and we know that he came to madras conducted a harikatha on the life of tyagaraja this is the first time that we hear that somebody conducted a harikatha on the life of tyagaraja and the hindu in its review says that a lot of new facts about the life of tyagaraja was brought forth in the harikatha therefore mm-hmm. we know that much of what we hear today as tyagaraja stories came from that particular fateful harikatha money was collected for the funding of the aradhana right it happens for a couple of years like that every year in january these two brothers they go there other musicians accompany them they conduct the aradhana unfortunately there is a falling out between the two brothers the elder mm-hmm. brother then decides that he will conduct the aradhana in kumbakonam the younger brother continues to conduct it in tiruvayyar elder brother then dies after a couple of years now because his he was the elder the group of musicians who conducted the aradhana with him they become the peddakachi or the periyakachi because he is the elder Hello. and the younger brother who continued in tiruvayyar conducting the aradhana in tiruvayyar itself he because he is the younger his group is called the chinnakachi now the remember that all women at that time who were performing were devadasis because okay. we are talking about 1906 1907 saraswati bai has not yet come on stage as the first non devadasi performer she is still 2 years away and even mm-hmm. after that she doesn't get involved in all this her guru and her family are busy getting her to perform harikatha and move on so no women nagaswaram right. artists were uh, so and then the periyakachi operates in kumbakonam chinnakachi operates over here now after some time malakota govind sami pillai who is a very famous violinist he is very actively involved in the periyakachi he decides that he will also conduct the aradhana in tiruvayyar itself Right. so on aradhana day what happens is you find both the kachis coming like two warring groups to conduct the aradhana of poor tyagaraja at the same time and there is a lot of friction and then by mutual consensus they arrive at a decision whereby they decide that the chinna kachi will perform its aradhana between a certain time in the morning and go away then periya kachi will come and conduct its aradhana and then go away so this is how they arrive at a mutual consensus and uh, the periyakachi is supported by govind sami pillai and then a lot of nagaswaram artists also because govind sami pillai you know he came from that community and then he gets a lot of them to come and that, that was the heyday of the nagaswaram tradition remember so you know a lot of money was collected by the nagaswaram artists and given to uh, govind sami pillai to conduct the aradhana periyakachi is really very prosperous chinnakachi right. is still very uh, you know brahmin dominated harikatha etc etc not so 
very prosperous. But they are just biding their time. And then what happens is over a period of time, people like Ariyakudi Ramanujayengar and all that, by the 1920s, they have become very big musicians themselves. And they all join the Chinnakachi. So Chinnakachi suddenly receives a massive boost in its, uh, okay. uh, in its uh, finances. And uh, monitoring it is a man called Sulamangalam Bhaidinath Bhagavata, a very big Harikatha artist, also a very a Sanathanist, shall I say. A man <laughs> who believed in the, uh, in the caste order, uh, in Sanskrit. Uh, you know, we may agree with him, we may not agree with him, but he was a man of his own views, shall I put it that way. He was a very powerful personality in his own right. He believed that the Nagaswara... Man of conviction. No, yeah, and he believed that the Nagaswaram artist had no place in the Thyagaraj Aradhana. And uh, they, uh, the Perikachi also incidentally believed the same thing. It was not any different. So, you know, the, to accommodate them on the last day. So, by the time money had come to play a big role. So, both the Kachis decided that they would conduct five-day Aradhanas. And they would feed the public of Thiruvayaru. They would have music performances, etc., etc. So, you know, public could not eat twice in the same day. So, finally, what happened was the Chinna Kachi decided that it would conduct its Aradhana Four days before the Aradhana, it would start its festival and end mm -hmm. on Aradhana day. Periyakachi would start on Aradhana day and then continue for four more days after that. So, for eight days, the people of Thiruvayaru did no work. Tanjavur area people did no work. They all came to Thiruvayaru. They camped there. They listened to music. They were fed. Mm -hmm. They didn't need anything. Basically, they were very happy. Everybody was happy. It was a right. matter of ego, each Kachi trying to boost who is, who is better, who is better, who is attracting which music. It's just like what happens in political parties. You know, you suddenly engineer defections on a massive scale from here to there. And then you get from people. Only money was not being paid. But people were being enticed in a very big way. So, eight right. days, Thirvayaru would be in a, in a, in a great shape. Yeah, after that, everybody will go away and Tyagaraja will be given over to the elements. And uh, nobody bothered with it. So, this woman in 1921, she gets this dream. Then she gets Bidaram Krishnapa's letter. She decides that she has to go and see. She, the interesting thing is she has never come to Thiruvayara before that. So, it's only right. now that she's waking up and she decides that I have to go. She suffered a so, huge disappointment in life. Right. For the sake of our audience, uh, let me just mention that uh, uh, Sri Vidaram Krishnappa was uh, the guru of uh, Nagaratnama in her earlier days. Yeah, please go on, sir. And uh, he, he has written her a letter saying, see, he's the only man who has actually lamented about the condition of the Tyagaraja Samadhi when the Aradhana is not going on. So we have to give him great credit. You know, this man, he was sensitive enough to realize something that it was that was staring everybody else in the face, but nobody had realized it. That the Samadhi was in a very bad way. And so he writes her a letter and he says, if, the, if at all there is somebody who can do something, it's only you. So Nagaratnama, <laughs> you know, challenge. So she arrives and I'll never forget Krishnan describing her arrival. He says, you know, he told me, such a fat woman, sir. She came in the bullock cart. She could not get off the bullock cart. So they unyoked the bullocks and they tilted the bullock cart and she just slid off onto one platform. Even then with great dignity, with, she said from head to foot, gold and diamonds. And he said, Thiruvayari had not seen a personality like this. And even though she had slid off that thing, enormous dignity seated in that stone platform. And I believe she said, I want to meet this uh, the, uh, Ramudu Bhagavatar, who is the descendant of Thyagaraja's brother. So, Ramudu Bhagavatar is summoned and it's a sensation in Thirvayar is that, you know, this some woman has arrived like this. And then Ramudu Bhagavatar takes her to Thyagaraja Samadhi and she is shocked that it is like this. And then she decides to do something and a woman like her decides to do something, she'll do it. So, she wants to find out who owns the property and then it's a burial ground with lots of Samadhis in it. It's run by a trust which is owned by the aristocratic Surve family, Marathi aristocrats. Mm -hmm. They don't have much money by the time the kingdom and all is long gone. Okay. You cannot sell a charitable trust land. You cannot alienate it for monetary considerations. Okay. So she buys land of the same size, fertile land in Tanjavur, gifts it to the trust and takes this land in exchange. So the whole okay. Bhava Swami Agraharam burial ground becomes Nagaratnama's property. Now, it's valueless. It's worthless. If you look at it as a commercial right. transaction, she has not bought it for any benefit of herself. 
and she does not right. buy just the samadhi she buys the whole burial ground everything she is bought that entire right. span of that burial ground is now nagaratnamas property and then she begins constructing the temple between 1921 and 1926 she builds the first the inner sanctum and uh, because there is no idol of tyagaraja she gets a dream she gets a tombstone maker to actually make the uh, uh, the idol of tyagaraja that we still see there and that is placed over there not everybody is happy sulamagalam vaidinatha bhagavadar calls the idol karupanna sami karupanna sami is a guardian deity in tirunelveli villages so okay. uh, he says it looks like that this does not look like my vision everybody has got their own idea of how tyagaraja looked right tyagaraja. so she has her idea so she made it like that so 1925 26 everybody is congratulated nagaratnam in fact uh, kirtanacharya cr srinivas aengar says you have done what nobody else has done you are great then 26 rikachi aradhana is going to start nagaratnam has also come it is her property and then when the aradhana is being done it is normally the practice for all each musician to sing one song which he or she or perform on an instrument when all the males have completed nagaratnam begins to sing whereupon all the instrument there is a dead silence and at hmm. the end of it malakota govind swami pillai tells her that sorry it is not the tradition to allow women to sing here hmm. nagaratnam is shocked she says this is my property this is tyagaraja all of us have sung his compositions why should i not sing he says no this is not the uh, practice women have no place here so she leaves in great anger and next year she locks the samadhi and prevents the aradhana from taking place and then the magistrate is called in police help is taken the police break the lock open and under police protection the chinakachi and the periyakachi conduct their aradhana and nagaratnamma when she comes to uh, realize that this is so she decides to start her own kachi which is called nagaratnamma kachi and she conducts the aradhana at the same time as the periyakachi's aradhana and uh, she conducts it behind the samadhi so her property is being used for aradhana by the periyakachi and the chinakachi she decides that she will not come in and perform and all that behind it she will conduct it in one vast plantain grove she buys that area she gets the plantains removed and then she begins conducting her aradhana there only women therefore only devadasis at that time so right. 40 to 50 devadasis would come every year and they would perform and you know where the crowd went thereafter uh right. the <laughs> what is it enta neerchina enta juchina enta varalaina kanta dasuli so everybody went to listen to the devadasis so they uh, and very clever so I, I, maybe i should i should just translate that part enta neerchina that is however much you are learned learned uh then they uh, enta juchina no matter what you saw no matter what you saw Yen... you are You Ultimately, everybody is a slave of woman. Slave of so, woman. This is the Agaraja, <laughs> wicked man, very wicked man. Let me tell you, he was not an ordinary person. Oh, Baba! Sometimes I look at, you know, this boy. He everywhere he drips with sarcasm about us. Bhatti kotti riti bhakshin si tiri gidi. That is what we are all doing. Like some bullock, we are stray bull. We are wandering from street to street, finding out where we can find food. this is our lives he is he is made enough comments about all of us anyway to come back over here so very clever nagaratnama she does not feed anybody she does not believe in poor feeding you want to eat you go to periyakachi saradhana and eat but if you want to listen to music you come here so no expenses in public feeding and all that no money being wasted for tindipotas people who have eaten very well <laughs> no that is periyakachi if they are stupid let them be stupid i am only here to provide worship to tyagaraja that's all and if any male musician was insulted by the periyakachi or chinakachi and was not given performance opportunity they were very welcome to come to nagaratnam haskachi and perform there also so this was how the nagaratnam haskachi became very powerful by the time govind swami pillai had become very ill he died the periyakachi lost its uh, importance they were very eager to have a merger now mm-hmm. suramangalam vaidinath bhagavatar was the stumbling block he would not allow for women he would not allow for nagaswaram artists and he would not allow for 
common feeding of everybody. He, he insisted on segregation on the basis of caste. Right. This Ramanuj, but then you know he was growing old, and the young Turks like Ramanujayengar, Musri Subramanya here, and suddenly from somewhere you find Semagudi Srinivasa. I don't know where he came from, but he was always on the winning side right through life. So there also he was on the winning side. Suddenly he plays a very important role in this whole thing. And they tell Vaidinatha Bhagavata that everything will happen as per the way you want it, but we would like to have a joint Aradhana. So sometime in 1940-41, the joint Aradhana is organized. And then thereafter, gradually the boundaries begin to break down. So common feeding is organized. The Rajaratnam Pillai stages a protest and says, why cannot Nagaswaram artists come inside and perform? And women have anyway been allowed because Nagarajna <laughs> Maskarji has, has come in. Right. Thereafter, Sula Mangala Vaidinath Bhagavad never comes back to Thirvayari. He stays away. He is disappointed. And he dies after that. He becomes a sannyasi. He passes away all that. Nagarajna herself, incidentally, is not very happy with the way the Aradhana happens thereafter. But, you know, she is happy that everybody is worshipping Tyagaraja. It is very interesting that in her will, she says that this property belongs to the Vidya Sundari Nagaratnamma Trust. It is given to perform Aradhanas only as long as women artists are allowed to perform them. If the women artists are not allowed to perform, then Aradhana is out of question. She has stipulated it in her will very clearly. And strange man, huh? this Tyagaraja, there is no understanding this. He was Avatara Purusha, there is no doubt about it. Ultimately, he achieved everything in his Samadhi through women. Nagaratnamma built the Samadhi. Padma Sinibai brought the silver vessels that were used in the Samadhi. Salem Chellapa Amal gave the flowers as long as she was alive. Kolar Nagaratnamma electrified the Samadhi. Brinda Mukta and M.S. Subalakshmi ensured that women joined the Unjabriti so that men alone cannot join that. All he achieved. He achieved through women. I told you, you know, about this aura that survives your physical. Tyagaraja's aura is still there. And, he, and in 1951, when Ambujam Krishna came to visit Tyagaraja Samadhi, something happened to her and thereafter she became a poet. This happily married housewife, the wife of T.S. Krishna, T.S. Krishna, the biggest industrialist in the TVS family, his wife became a poet. And after that, she could compose in Telugu, Tamil, Hindi and Sanskrit. Simple, not complicated words. But she wrote po lyrics and then they were set to music by others. But she became a poet. This Tyagaraja did all this. He fulfilled himself through every woman. Uh, who had come to worship with a sense of piety. Uh, I, I, you know, I would not play with Tyagaraja. I think he is too powerful a personality. Uh, that's all I will say. <laughs> uh, for the sake of our viewers, Tyagaraja is named after the deity of Tiruvarur, Tyagaraja. And uh, the, uh, we also learned about the story of Kondi from that Tyagaraja Swami temple. So, which was... Yeah, uh, and strangely, he never composed on that temple. Though he was born there, he didn't compose on that temple. It's a big mystery. Maybe songs are lost. We don't know anything about this. Right. So, uh, it has been a very great pleasure uh, talking to you, Sri Ramji. In fact, uh, there are a number of points that you write in your book, which we haven't been able to touch. But I do hope that, say, uh, we do have some other occasion where uh, all these things can be uh, brought out. In Thank fact... You. The discussion that you mentioned about uh, Muttuparani's uh, Radhika Santunam, that possibly requires one special session on its own <laughs> for a variety of reasons. So hopefully we'll have that uh, pretty soon. And uh, for all our viewers, I do hope that uh, uh, you'll be able to take a copy and look at the works of uh, Sri V. Sri Ram, especially this book, uh, which is a remarkable book for giving us a glimpse of how past was and at the same time, giving us sufficient kind of uh, inputs for us to reimagine what could be future. With this, thank you. I, thank thank you. you very much for having invited me. Thanks a lot.